You notice the uh, title of the sermon is called Figs for the Cake. That was not a misspelling. No, no, accident. It was done on purpose. The sermon has to, to do with being cool. Therefore, K O O L. Our scripture text for today, as Margaret read, is taken from Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 14. I will share this with you again. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou riest down, and when thou risest up. Verse 8. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and bind them on your foreheads. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please allow us to come before your presence with thanksgiving, making a joyful noise unto you with songs. Lord, we ask for the covering presence of the Holy Spirit, bringing the presence of Jesus to shine his light upon us. As we open your word this morning, we ask for guidance, for power, for conviction through your Holy Spirit. Bless us today, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Cool kids. In 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 3, it says, Abijah walked in the sins of his father. He did not do very well. Then it says in verse 26 that Nadab did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of his father. Numerous times in the scripture we can read over and over and over where this person or that person followed in the evil ways of their father. Did evil. We as parents really have to be careful. First Kings 22, verse 51, we read that Ahaziah did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father. Friends, our offsprings are following us. No matter what we do as parents, and even as adults, we've been watched. We may not think so, but these are observing us. If you want to be cool kids, then you can't be a negligent parent. Parents are object lessons that their children are going to follow. I once read a poem that went something like this. There was a crooked man who had a crooked smile, who made a crooked fortune in a very crooked style. He lived a crooked life, as crooked people do and wondered why it turned out that his sons were crooked and dramatic. I've heard it said that some parents just don't get to the seat of the problem. You know what I mean. I think that's correct because the seat of the problem might be you or me. Some parents don't try to correct themselves. Parents might be the seat of the problem and so Child rearing age to begin over a hundred years ago, before the babies were born. As adults, when you go home after church and you're sitting around the lunch table, do you have roasted pastor? Do you bad mouth the church? <coughs> do you bad mouth the preacher? Or bad mouth the conference? Who's listening? Our children. Or listen. And they say, as they're watching us, oh, is that how am I supposed to act? Like my mom, like my dad, like the adults, I say. 
And then you wonder why don't they attend church when they get older? There might be a reason. Be very careful. I'm sure that we've read in the newspapers about newspaper columnists by Peter Abbey, Ann Matters. This mother wrote Ann Matters a few years ago. She said, Dear Ann Matters, what happened between parents and children in the last 15 years? The Bible says, and she quoted Proverbs 22, verse 6. The Bible says, Train up a child in the way it should go, and when it is old, it will not depart from it. The poor mother said, I don't believe the Bible. Her heart is breaking. She says, I don't believe this verse because our only four children are living proof. We always went to church together. We had plenty of love and responsibility in our homes. Everybody was fine until they started high school or went away to college. Now our sons and daughters look like bums. They have no interest in decent clothes. They're college graduates, three of them, and yet they don't find jobs that they like. Don't they realize that life isn't all fun and pleasure? We parents are fed up with the scraggly appearance and foul language and lazy life and total disregard for authority. My husband is in his early 50s and he is a broken man. We cry for each other. And for thousands of other parents who feel that they have failed, we did our best. What did we do wrong? And I just wrote back. You know what she said? These very wise words. She said, don't be spared. The jury is still out. Many children come to their senses again. You did. Plenty of far out children do a complete reversal. They become conservative, even square, and it could occur with your children. Pray that it will. Don't give up. So if your children have gone over into Fool's Hills, what if your children are adults now and they're still living in your house? What do you do? They won't move out, they can't get a job, and they're on Facebook all day. They won't do any housework and they're lazy bums. What do you do with kids like that? Well, don't give up on them. Pray for them. Believe in them. Set a right example in front of them. Never, ever give up on them. I don't think you should worry about whether your youngsters dislike broccoli, Brussels sprouts, or other vegetables for that matter. Don't worry about that. Because the same kids, at some time or another, didn't black girls. They change. They can change. Time changes things. And Psalms 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? You know what the Bible says? By living according to the Word of God. So parents need to instill the Bible. Some of your grandparents need to give your children grandchildren at Christmas, the devotional book, maybe a Bible. Give them a nice devotional book to read on a daily basis. They learn that the highest adventure of life is to be a lovable and loving Christian. Let them see you read your Bible. Let them see you mark on your Bible. Let them see you on your knees. Or not your heart. That's how change happens. I hold in my hands two different things. We've seen these before. One is a thermostat, and the other is a thermometer. They're both dealing with temperature. I want to talk to you first about the thermostat. You notice that the thermostat has a little lever that you can move back and forth. You can control the temperature. You can cool or hot. It's in control. On the other hand, the thermometer is changing with the environment. 
You can't control it. This one is in charge. Whatever the events of life are, it decides what's going to happen. It has authority, and you can move it if it hold a hot. It doesn't matter what it is, it's always in charge. It's not influenced by what we would call peer pressure. It's not influenced by anything, it's going to control the situation. This one reacts to the situation. May I ask, which one of these would be best for you? The thermostat or the thermometer? I think you know the answer, don't you? You need to be in charge yourself of how you react to the things of life. Things that might not always be perfect, but you're in charge of that. Nobody's in charge of you except Jesus himself. And that's the one that you want to be in charge of your life. You can influence others or you can let others influence you. But may I suggest that you be a thermostat. There are times that I don't really understand teenagers. Teenagers are people who demand to be different, and yet they all wear the same clothes. I don't understand that. They all go to shopping at the same stores. They all look alike. I just can't figure that out. The Bible says in Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be renewed by the changing of your mind. Be transformed. There was an emperor in China who was getting very old. And he decided it's time that I pick a new emperor to take my place. And so he called all the kids and his kingdom together. And he was surrounded by several hundred kids of his kingdom. The emperor says to them, Children, I've lived a long life. I've been there and done that. It's time for me to turn over the power to somebody else. And I'm going to choose one of you that is standing here to be the new emperor. You will be the new em emperor, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give each one of you a seed. And I want you to take this seed home, get your parents to help you, and I want you to plant it in a pot. Then I want you to faithfully water the seed and tend to it, and put it in the sunshine and take care of it until it grows. Is that fair enough? Well, yes, he said, that's fair. And on that day, I will choose which one of you will be the actual next emperor. This will be a one year from today. And they all agree. Now, there was one small boy by the name of Wayne. He took his precious seed home. And he says, I want to be the next emperor. I may be small, but I want to be the next emperor. Ming went to his mother and asked her to help him. And so she said she went to him to see him. The first three weeks, as Ming watered his seed, set the pot in the sunshine, and waited for it to grow. And three weeks later, nothing happened. The seed was still there. Bam. It was a pop. Mom, my seed's not growing. She says, let's give us some water. Do the best you can. So you kept watering. Four months later, I kept checking it, and there was no change. Six months, months went by. And he was faithful, and all the other kids were showing off their beautiful plants. Their seeds were growing. This made Ling feel very bad. Why, 
why is, are there seeds growing? There's beautiful plants, and mine is not doing anything. His mother said, do the best you can. Don't give up. Finally, one year went by. And all the youngsters made their way to the emperor because they were supposed to show up exactly one year later. So they all came with their pots. Ling said, I'm not going to go, Mom, because my seed didn't grow. She said, well, you did your best. Just go and take your part. That's OK, son. You did your best. That's all we can do. So reluctantly, Ling went before the emperor for the other place. He stood near the back, hoping that nobody could see him. And all the other kids were there, and some of them had their big, beautiful plants, lush, green. His part was empty. Then the kids began to laugh at him, poke fun. Finally, the emperor came out on the stage. And he motioned for everybody to be quiet. He said, all right, it's been one year. I see that you all have come back. He looked over everybody. Finally, he saw Lane. Finally, in the back. He appointed two security guards to go and get him and bring him forward. Lang was scared to death. He was trembling. He was hot. That big pot, this one little seed that's not growing. The security guards asked him, What's your name? Ling. The emperor, the emperor looked at him. All the kids were snickering and laughing. And the emperor looked at him lonely and he finally said, Come forward. Next step forward. He says, Here's your next emperor. Ling will be your new emperor. Everybody thought, What? How can that be? Ling couldn't believe it himself. He couldn't even grow his seed, and yet he was going to be the new emperor? What's going on here? Then the emperor said, you see, one year ago, I gave each one of you a precious seed. You all took it home, you planted the seed, then you all came back today. I gave all of you seeds that had been boiled in hot water. Not one of them. Would germinate. All of you except Lang and substituted your seed, my seed, for one of your own. Lang is the only person here who was honest. Lang is the only person here who had the courage to come to my, with this empty pot and show it to me. I respect him for that. Lang is your next emperor. Be honest, boys and girls. Ling obeyed his mom. Ephesians 6 1 says, Children obey your parents of the Lord because this is right. You need to be quick to do the right thing, to be honest and not cheat in school. Be brave. Even when your life might look like a failure, it's not a failure. If you're going to do anything at all, do the best you can. Your parents teach your children to be honest. Don't help them to cheat. Your kids, follow Jesus all the way. And let Jesus lead your a real honest life, if you will. Back in the 1940s, hundreds of people were killed in a tragic accident in the road. It happened in El Toro, Spain. In a big town, El Toro. Town, it was called in Leon, Spain. The train was, you know, one of those long trains that looked like they were either half a mile to three quarters of a mile in length. At one end was the lead locomotive. And this locomotive was pulling the train. And at the same time, at the other end, at the tail end of the train, instead of a caboose, there was another locomotive. This train dragged along. 
But it was there for an emergency. If something happened to the lead locomotive, then the locomotive on the end would push the cars forward. There was an engineer in the front locomotive, and there was an engineer in the rear locomotive. So they went along in this long passenger train, and there were hundreds of people on board. They came to this tunnel, and as they were going through the tunnel, the front engine lost power for some reason. The train came to a stop in the tunnel. Smoke was blowing up inside the tunnel. Both engines were in the tunnel at the same time. The back engineer thought, something is wrong. We're stopped. There was no communication back in those days between the late locomotive and the rear locomotive. So he says, I wonder what's wrong up ahead. I'm going to get us out of here. So he put his locomotive in reverse and began to pull the train, the cars backward. But at the same time that he was trying to go in reverse, the lead locomotive got the problem fixed. And he began to go forward. So you have both of these locomotives pulling in opposite directions. They noticed they weren't moving. So they both applied more power to go forward and go backward. But you know what happened? There was no ventilation in that tunnel, and smoke began to billow and go forward and forward. All 521 people perished. Do you know why they died? Because they had too many engineers. Because there were two engineers instead of one. Two people in charge. The Bible says that Matthew, no man can serve two masters. Your kids cannot have the Lord in charge of one in your life and the devil of the other in your life. Because they're going to pull you in opposite directions. You're going to be stuck. You understand what I'm talking about? You need Jesus to be totally in charge of your life. You've got to allow him to do this. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Let it be the Lord. You need to choose him. One day I was like starting on Broadway. Many of you have done this. You stopped in traffic at a signal light. I looked at the Bible speaker ahead of me. Back of it, it said, My child is an honor student. It's such a school. And while sitting there, I thought, Well, that's very nice. That's a very intelligent child. And the parents have a right to be proud. That's good. But I have yet to see a bumper sticker on the back of a car that says, My child is not an honor. My child memorizes his habits of lessons. Grace are important, but so is godliness. Which is the most important? Well, they're both important, but let's not eliminate the godliness in favor of grace. Let's be proud of our kids because of the spiritual things that they accept in their lives. When we send our kids off to some little camp, we pack them up, put all the things in that they will need to experience a great summer camp. Your parents have kids. How many years? 18, 19, 20, 21 years? They're in your house. While you have your kids under your roof, you need to be packing their life with Jesus. Pack them for the things that, that they will need when they get out and experience their own life. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. And all these things will be added. I want to read you a summation for the kids. Somebody wrote this. Here's what they wrote. Kids love luxury. Our kids love luxury. Our youth have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disregard for their elders. They love to chatter in place of exercise. 
The children are now parents. They're not the servants of their household. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict and talk back to the parents. They chatter before company. They gobble up food. They tyrannize their teachers. You know who wrote this? It didn't come from Spalding Andre. It came from Socrates, back in the year 400. You see? Before Christ, this type of behavior was taking place. There's nothing new. Children have always been a challenge. Friends, we're starting a new year, but I want to challenge you children and you parents here today with the words of Ecclesiastes 12 1. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Please do that. Put Jesus first in your life, and He will lead you 